where I was a kind of signed up adherent of the communicative approach, as were my trainee students, and yet uh, we weren't seeing a great deal of real communication in the classroom. And I think, you know, the communicative approach, without wanting to go into the history of that, but it had sent, in a sense, had been sort of, I wouldn't say betrayed, but certainly redirected back onto um, the very traditional uh, grammatical syllabus, etc. And as, as Jane will, will attest, the, some of the original uh, excitement of the initial communicative approach in the mid 70s and the 80s, it had, was, had sort of dissipated to a large extent, despite the hard work that people like Jane have been doing to um, keep the flame of task-based learning uh, alive. And so uh, on my teacher training courses, I we were becoming increasingly insistent that people find space for real communication and student generated content which wasn't didn't have a name then but it's now it's a it's a construct that you read about in research uh and so i um uh this is what we were doing uh which required less reliance on materials and more uh space for the learners to contribute to the uh content of the lesson the direction of the curriculum even and I found an analogy in the dogma uh, 1995 film movement, which was also pledged as a kind of rescue action, but for cinema. And I thought, yeah, what we need is a rescue action for English language teaching. And um, so I wrote a, an article, very short one page article for uh, the IATEFL newsletter. And uh, very, very quickly, uh, I got responses from Luke was one of the first um the first cab off the rank if you like uh to let me know that this totally and utterly aligned with his own uh thoughts and views uh although he came was working in a quite different context and various other people uh got in touch and so we thought well you know let's let's stay together and let's let's share ideas about how this might be enacted in the actual classroom in all sorts of different contexts and that was when we started the Yahoo discussion group, which lasted up to 10 years, I think, generated a vast volume of discussion, controversy, practical ideas, uh, references to other like minded movements. Uh, and and then we felt that uh, it was time uh, that we kind of condensed some of this discussion into book form hence um the book we, luke and i wrote was published in 2009 uh and that brings us up to the point that you mentioned isabella 10 years ago or, or 12 years ago now and in a minute perhaps we'll talk about what's happened subsequently but luke maybe you want to fill in your own um you know where you were coming from sure Thanks, Scott. Well, um, I, st I, I used to, um, 10, 20 years ago, the first kind of conferences that I did with Scott, I was nervous that I didn't have enough experience. And so I was keen to be able to say that I'd been teaching for almost 20 years and almost 25. But I now realize it is actually 35 years since I qualified by taking my CELTA in 1987. Um, so I'm, I'm not keen now to say uh, any more than it really is. And I, I think I came into English language teaching at the very moment that Scott describes um, a kind of retrenching from uh, from more communicative approaches um, into a more explicitly grammar focused uh, way of teaching. Uh, you had the enormously successful and influential Headway series, which came out, I think, first in 1985 um, and where they you know, much of the clarity for educators came from the fact that they had the grammar literally colored blue. So you knew exactly where the grammar was in the book. Um, you also had Raymond Murphy's English Grammar in Use came out one or two years later. Um, and, you know, it really sort of, I think it did those things and, and trends generally took the attention away from a, a more, perhaps more communicative, certainly a more experimental ways of teaching. And I, I struggled with this, I must say, um, 
as a young teacher, um, didn't uh, enjoy teaching very much until I heard about the lexical approach, actually, um, and was told uh, in a talk by Jimmy Hill in what must have been 1991 or something, that um, the teacher was a valid source of input into the classroom. So uh, from years of trying not to speak and, and measuring my own teacher talking time on a, on a stopwatch to make sure I didn't say too much, I started trying to talk with the students. Um, and it, it was uh, a, a revelation. You know, they opened up. They started to talk about their own lives as I started to share um, uh, you know, carefully things from my own. Um, and so I then started really through the, the late 1990s to experiment with a much more conversational kind of teaching, you know, a much more dogma or unplugged style of teaching, although we didn't have a name for it in the profession. Um, and so when Scott published that, that article, I, I just thought that's everything that I've been trying to explain to my teachers in the school I was running at the time. It's everything that I felt about teaching over the last 10, 15 years, but wasn't quite able to articulate. And that's why I uh, emailed you that day, I think, when I read it, <laughs> Scott. Um, yeah, then, then uh, as you say, in, in our different ways, you did more training than me at that time. Uh, I did a, uh, some writing for The Guardian in the mid 2000s, which uh, a bit like the Yahoo group was was became quite uh, intense at times. Um, it was sort of the early days of blogs and the readers were encouraged to comment on, on the column that I had in the mid 2000s and were pretty rude about it uh, at times. And um, uh, I think that's one reason why, you know, this sort of energy continued and we were finally asked to, to write the book, which came out in 2009. And I think it's worth mentioning that it won a British Council Elton in 2010, which is where a lot of the kind of impetus came from. I think it did help to validate it. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's where I got to. So until that point, I'd largely been a classroom teacher and done some journalism. Yeah, and I, I can't help um, get away from the fact that Jane Willis is in the room. But I mean, it was very much the case for me, and I think for many teachers, that the task-based approach did represent to us a viable alternative, but we, there weren't materials that could really implement it. But that was when we were still so focused on materials. And I think so. what emerged out of the di initial discussions with Luke and the rest of the group was that, well, maybe you don't need materials to to implement a task-based approach or an approach which is not exclusively focused on teaching the third conditional uh, or the third person S or whatever it was today because it happens to be on the syllabus. So, and I think, in, you know, I think that was where we were, so that where I was coming from, but there were all sorts of other feeder fields at the time. And Luke's mentioned the lexical approach, and that was extremely influential because it did offer a, a kind of alternative, although it's debatable whether there was a methodology really associated with it. It just seemed that the, the, you know, the danger of the lexical approach was that it just became another way of delivering small items of language that had been pre-selected, as opposed to working with the language that comes out of the conversation in the room or the texts that the learners produce. We shouldn't just focus on conversation. I mean, there's a place for learner generated content in the form of written language, just as much as in spoken language. But I think, yeah, the lexical approach and the lexical approach also signaled that there were, uh, there was a different way of thinking about language. Uh, and with the work that Jane and Dave Willis were doing, there was a different approach to organizing the syllabus organizing a syllabus semantically, for example, according to meanings as opposed to according to forms, which had been a, a, a basic principle of the communicative approach when it was first, re, first conceived. Uh, and so and another influence on me, of course, was sort of late stage humanism, if you like. That is to say the kind of progressive humanist educational movement that that was very much uh, uh, very popular, particularly in, the, in North America 
and had sort of filled the vacuum that had been created by the end of audiolingualism. And so you get all these kind of niche methods like suggestopedia and uh, total physical response and the natural approach, etc. But again, these kind of signal that there was another way of thinking, not so much about language, but there's another way of thinking about learning. That learning was a holistic process, should involve the whole learner, not just their mind, but also their emotions, their experiences, their wishes, their hopes, their desires, their fears, their aspirations, etc. And a lot of the rhetoric of the humanist, humanistic approach, particularly as expressed by people like Earl Stevick in his time, filtered through into our own, our own thinking. Uh, and so those were two important feeder fields. But an awful lot has happened subsequently, subsequent even to 2009, which to me, to my way of thinking, tends to validate uh, the do a dogma methodology uh, in terms of how people are rethinking theories of second language acquisition, how the research is moving very much towards now what is called the social turn or was called that originally in 2004 the social turn in second language acquisition research moved away from the from the black box of the mind and moved out into the context in which learners were learning and using language the context of the classroom which was a small society if you like a mini culture even uh with its complexity uh, and the larger context of the world outside the classroom, uh, including the world that the learners aspired to join or were learning English to become a member of the, the community of practice or the discourse community, if you like. So these influences were came afterwards, in a sense, uh, but they fed into the, the constant conversation that we were all having about it and uh they as i say they see, seem to validate a lot of that original thinking about dogma that it was uh it was trying to emphasize the social aspects of language use and therefore the social aspects of language learning luke have you i mean scott can you can you hear me yes okay i can't uh, see you guys because i appear to have lost a network connection which i'll try to re-establish in a second. Um, I, th I think it's worth adding into this mix, since Scott, you mentioned um, the sort of holistic uh, view uh, provided by late humanism, as you put it. Um, I think it's also worth mentioning whole language learning, which was a, another of the um, sort of more uh, I don't know, liberal almost, or... Uh... Whoops, we've lost Luke. He left the meeting. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll finish on what he's saying. There's a whole language movement, uh, which was a, a, a mainstream educational, it wasn't just for language learning alone, but it was the idea that uh, you. Uh, Hi, learned. everyone. It could, yeah. There you go. I'm just filling in while you. Um, I was leave trying the to room. say something about whole language learning, but yes. my screen was going off. Anyway, there's a. There's a um, a famous quote by Frank Smith, who's involved in the whole language learning movement in the States, um, which was, uh, to summarize, I think he said it pretty much word for word, people learn to read by reading. Um, and I think it's a useful thing to take into this discussion about the long conversation, um, because as teachers, I think we, we know and we feel that students should be able to learn to speak by speaking and learn to communicate by communicating and if there isn't enough speaking uh, not enough speaking not enough conversation not enough real communication it reflects their needs and interests um uh, and, and the focus is only on the little pieces of the language that they are then expected to put together outside the classroom um then we're we're missing that the the whole experience of language um uh, that that is that is the real experience. You know, we don't experience language outside the classroom as a series of grammar points uh, or as um, kind of controllable lexical fields. Um, and and uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you're grabbing a book. I am grabbing a book. Right. I am grabbing a book uh, because one of the other things, this is a, a book that was published again by a, an educationist working in New Zealand and 
coincidentally or what, I mean, or not, we, were, we went to school together, Stuart McNaughton, who's now the head of, professor of education, University of Auckland. And he, uh, he's talking about uh, the, the challenge faced by many teachers teaching, particularly uh, young learners or in, in, in uh, public schools, teaching, dealing with the diversity in classrooms, particularly in large urban contexts, even in New Zealand has large urban contexts with multilingual uh, classes, children from all uh, many different language groups, etc., and gr great diversity in terms of level. And he, his argument is you, one way of dealing with the diversity is you have what's, what he calls a broad curriculum, uh, a broad curriculum as opposed to a narrow one. Because the broader the curriculum, that is to say, in terms of the way you describe its, its objectives, the more likely it is to accommodate the kind of diversity you find in a typical classroom, not just in an urban city centre, but in any classroom there's going to be diversity. But if you have a narrow curriculum, which is what the grammar curriculum is, today we're going to do the, you know, the present perfect continuous, whether you like it or not, whether you're ready for it or not, whether you've done it before or not, that's what we're going to do. And then tomorrow we'll do the third conditional and then we'll do phrasal verbs. That's a very narrow curriculum and it doesn't accommodate the enormous diversity within the classroom. We're not talking just about levels, we're talking about preferences in terms of how people learn, talking about their communicative needs, uh, their past experience, their first language, etc. So I really like this idea of distinguishing between a narrow and a broad curriculum. And I would say coming back to task-based learning, a task-based learning is by definition a broad curriculum. Because instead of saying we're going to do the present perfect continuous today, so we're going to do a task which involves talking about recent activities and we're going to do a survey and find out who's had the most interesting weekend and blah, 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 blah. Now the present perfect continuous may come up and we can almost engineer that it will come up. And if it doesn't come up, we can put it in later but the point is that, that that task is much more likely to engage more learners for a longer period of time than today we're going to do the present perfect continuous. So I really, yeah. really like that. It and I've sort of been looking ever since at curricula through that kind of lens. Is this a broad or a narrow curriculum? And coming back to the lexical approach, this is not Michael Lewis's fault, but there's a danger that the, that the lexical approach could become a very, very narrow curriculum. We're just going to learn a lot of chunks. Yeah, I, I think I'd add in another um, thought on why it's important that students experience the broad curriculum, this idea that they work with language as a whole and not just language when it's been broken up into uh, itemized pieces. Uh, and that as part of that, that they feel present as themselves, wholly themselves. Um, I, I, think, I think we fail our learners if we don't give them that chance to experience language. Sort of, uh, you know, people sometimes talk about it in the wild, um, as it naturally emerges with the challenges that come up. So they're not fully prepared. And we as teachers may not be fully prepared for every emergent um, grammar point, every emergent word, um, but that we are learning to navigate and, and that the students are learning to navigate in the ways that they'll need outside the classroom. Um, one analogy, a fairly simplistic one that I sometimes use is if all we do is give people the bits of the language, it's about, it's a bit like teaching somebody how to drive in a parked car. Um, but, you know, you, you know where everything is in the car, you can turn the engine on and off, but, you know, you have to get out and get moving to understand what it's like to drive and to learn to be a driver. And you have to understand what the other cars are doing and what the other people are doing and the whole context of being on the road. Yeah, that's a great analogy because it breaks down a little bit in terms of driving, because if you just say, OK, get onto the main highway and drive, then you're in danger of killing somebody. But with language, you're not in danger of killing somebody if you get onto yeah. the main highway and speak. So, you know, nothing could go wrong <laughs> in the classroom. And the lovely, things about, lovely thing about classrooms is that they're very, on the whole, very supportive environments. Uh, I find, found that both as, this, as a teacher, but also as a student. I yeah. went back to class recently 
to brush up my fossilized Spanish. And what I just loved about the classroom ecology was the way everybody was kind of, nobody felt threatened, everybody was supportive of each other. And it was the teachers doing, to a large extent, by creating that kind of ambiente. But it was also the shared purpose of everybody in the room, which wasn't, we're not here to learn the present perfect continuous necessarily, or whatever the equivalent is in Spanish, but we're here to get better. We were here to become better communicators. Uh, of course, you know, scratch any student and they'll say, uh, but I want the grammar because they think that's what language consists of. Uh, and then we have to do a little bit of education and say, well, yeah, okay, well, I'll teach you some grammar, but not necessarily only grammar. So I guess, Luke, you know, I mean, the, we've talked uh, about dogma as if it was the best thing to, since sliced bread, since sliced syllabuses. Yeah. But it gets a lot of criticism, or not criticism, a lot of doubt about saying, oh, well, you can't throw out the grammatical syllabus. Um, you just can't replace it with conversation. And that, that way kind of anarchy lies. I mean, how, mm. how have you addressed that criticism? Yeah, well, I, th I think that's something that I've learned to to think about differently um, and perhaps to address differently since 2010, since I started doing more teacher training and, and, you know, taking these ideas, if you like, sharing these ideas with people in different countries, different parts of the world, because certainly um, people very often are enthusiastic about the ideas and principle, but are nervous about how they can be applied um and people in all, all kinds of different countries have said and we were talking about this uh, an hour or so ago scott that um you know it's very difficult for me to to unplug here because we have this test or we have this uh, this system which is is very um restrictive um and what i learned is that people were saying that all over the world that the same kind of challenges um the same restrictions the same kind of standardized testing um directed syllabus and curriculum was was broadly in operation everywhere so it makes it a shared challenge for us all wherever we're teaching um and you know i think it's important to recognize that teachers in general whatever institution they work in um are usually bound to follow a syllabus um, this is usually via a course book, um, and it usually leads to an exam. I mean, this is kind of one of the givens of our work as educators, is that, is that we prepare our students for exams, uh, that we use course books to do it, and those course books reflect a linear syllabus. Um, so I think what, what I've become increasingly interested in is how we can find space within our lessons, within our courses, within our teaching years, to uh, to be more interactive with our students, to be more spontaneous, to work with emergent language. Um, and then how we can make sense of that language in the context of a linear syllabus and the exam that looms at the end of term, or at the end of the school year. Um, so it becomes about working in two different ways at the same time, if you like. We can follow the course book, we can work towards the exam, but if we find space and make the most of it, then it's a case of working with the language and the opportunities and the communication that arises from that. In other words, it's not all or nothing. Um, you know, unplugging can be something which happens during classes, uh, in between uh, phases of a lesson. Um, it doesn't, it's, it's it, you know, we're trying to be realistic here, I guess. And uh, yeah, that's a, a long answer to your question, Scott. No, no, it's a very, very good answer. And, and you're absolutely right. And I think it's it's about, yeah, it's it's about, I guess, the, sort of the micro opportunities, as you say, that you have in a, in a normal classroom interaction, and that when things do come up, that you let them come up. Because, you know, I think as all, all of us as teachers have, have been confronted with a situation where something's come up unexpectedly some students spontaneously offered something that is actually triggered by may have been triggered by something in the course book uh but it's 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 something personal it's something uh that they're trying to communicate to the rest of the class it may come up in that first five minutes of the uh, you know beginning of the lesson chat and you 
as a teacher, you're thinking, hmm, okay, now what? Do I run with this or do I let it go? Um, and I think, you know, I, as a teacher, would normally have said, well, I'll, I'll let it go because I've got a syllabus to teach and there's an exam at the end of the month kind of thing. And also because I didn't really think that these spontaneous out, you know, well, this little crack that opens up in a class has any learning potential. And I think one of the things we discovered as we talked more and more about teaching unplugged and read more and more about some of the kind of theoretical background show that, oh no, hang on, it's these little moments that often are the ones that where the real learning potential is. These are the things that the students will remember. They won't remember the bulk of the lesson, but they will remember that thing that, you know, when Jorge was talking about his wretched wedding. And, <laughs> and I mean, <clears throat> so there is a lot of research now that suggests that these, these spontaneous moments are actually gold in terms of language learning. And therefore, we shouldn't shun them. We've got to kind of accommodate them if we can without jettisoning the course book or the syllabus or the exam. And there yeah. is, as Luke says, it's not a case of all or nothing. It's a case of trying to fold in those dogma moments and also create the classroom ambiente, again, that I'm talking about, that is conducive to these things coming up. So when something does come up that's spontaneous, you say, wow, Jorge, that's fantastic. I didn't know that. Let's quickly talk. Anybody else had that experience? Pull out a little bit of language from it, put it on the board, etc. write it down. Now, let's go back to page 56. Yeah. Well, I, I, I like the word you used when you talked about like a crack in the lesson. It made me think of that famous Leonard Cohen lyric. Uh, there is a crack in everything. That's where the light gets in. Ah. Uh, and I do think these cracks in lessons can be where the light comes in where literally people's faces light up because they're suddenly talking about their own lives and, and perhaps you're sharing something and they can see, oh yeah, you are a real person, not just teacher. Um, and, you know, we, we, we live in um, a teaching culture and education culture, which is typically, uh, I would say, an increasingly tightly controlled. Um, and so we are expected to know what we're going to teach in what order and we're expected to time it quite precisely. And sometimes one sees in uh, lesson plans for an observed lesson, for example, if you're observing um, phases of a lesson that are timed to a minute or two minutes, um, which, which is frankly crazy and nothing in a lesson should be timed at the planning stage at less than five minutes, I would say. Um, but, you know, we think, and this makes us tense, you know, and when our lesson plan has anticipated problems, as a feature of it. Uh, it you know what does that mean anticipated problems oh goodness that could go wrong but i'll deal with it this way so perhaps as well as anticipated problems it's good to think about what might happen uh, you know how to prepare and how to, how to be ready but as well as anticipated problems maybe think about unexpected opportunities um, and get used to as, as scott says running with that and and you know almost saying to the students wow let's let's talk about this now um, and then developing a range of activities and, and tasks that you can operate in that context to make the most of it, to keep that conversation going, to keep that kind of light in, in, in people's eyes there. Absolutely. And I always come back to mention again and again and again that uh, article by Dick Allwright that came out in the Tissot Quarterly in 1998 or 1999, where he, or maybe no, it's a bit later actually, where he talks about planning. Yes, we have to plan as teachers, we have to prepare, but not preparing for teaching points so much as for learning opportunities. Yeah. So not preparing to teach the present for the continuous, but creating learning opportunities in the classroom and maximizing the learning opportunities that may arise spontaneously. And I think as experienced teachers, oh, yeah, so, yeah, but I do that, I've done that. And this is, the, this is the case. All the research into teachers' professional lives shows that as teachers become more experienced, most of them gravitate to a, a style of teaching which is much more learner-focused. Why? Because they recognize the light in the student's eyes when, it, <laughs> when when they do something that 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 values the teachers uh, the learners uh, output, but also because it's just more interesting, 
I think there's also, also sorry, sorry, Scott. I, I think there's also the light in our eyes as teachers well, yeah. um, across our careers. You know, the the idea mm. that we stay fully engaged um, and interested in what we're what we're doing, rather than going through the motions and getting into a routine and and you know teaching the same course book in the same way um, term after term, year after year. Sorry, go on. No, no, I just, it reminds me, I've, I've just saved it here. Somebody on a, I'm doing a, an online dogma course at the moment for the International Teacher Development Institute, and somebody posted this in the forum. I remember the time when I had some teaching practice in a state school. I had to observe a typical class of one teacher to be able to teach a group. The teacher was really intimidating. She was sticking to the book, constantly making remarks to bored students and not allowing anyone to speak up and practice language naturally. It felt as if these students were not people to her. After that, I talked to pupils privately and asked them what they liked and disliked about English classes. They told me they felt extremely uncomfortable because the teacher was not taking them seriously and was not interested in them as future personalities. I would say not just future personalities, but as present personalities. Yeah. But that was kind of, you know, that's an extreme. But in a sense, it's sort of like mm, the default setting for education generally and for language education was the teacher at the front of the room lecturing about the grammar. I think that's what we were trying to do with dogma originally was kind of rescue teaching, as I said before. Uh, and, and you're absolutely right. It's about it's a reciprocal light when when these things start to happen and, and they recognize that you're interested and you, you recognize that they're interested. So. Um, and I think I think that I think that point also leads us to another um, major question that people have about applying unplugged which is uh, you know to do with teaching expertise teaching experience um, and I, I I kind of have two answers to this one is I should have more uh, but but often have two answers one is that it would be great if we could build the idea of in, of um, spontaneous teaching learning moments into initial teacher training um, so that people feel that it's something that they can do, something that they should do. Um, and and the, the should takes me to the second part, which is it's related to the light in our eyes. It's related to our own professional development. If we don't experience uncertainty in the classroom, um, then we don't grow professionally because we're not exposing ourselves to learning opportunities ourselves as teachers. Um, there's a, a, another analogy uh, I sometimes use is that course books are a sort of hand-holding operation. Um, they allow us to hold our learners' hands as they go through each unit um, so that we've anticipated all the problems and we know exactly where they're going um, and, uh, and they, they feel safe. But if we're holding their hand, then they're also holding our hand and we're not developing uh, at the speed and in the ways that we might otherwise do. So it's, I think it was Donald Schoen who said that it's important for uh, practitioners, I think he just meant teachers, to experience uncertainty mm -hmm. in the course of their daily lives. If we don't mm -hmm. test ourselves, if we don't experience mm -hmm. moments where we're thinking, OK, what do I do with that? And then learning how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Ideally, because we've been told that this is part of the process of being an educator in pre-service training, um, then, then we don't develop. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I just remember Earl Stevick said somewhere that using a course book is like driving in first gear, but you can't drive in first gear all the time. <laughs> yeah. you, need move, you need to move up through it. You remember when we had gear shifts? And anyway, you need to reverse uh, sometimes as well. Anyway, uh, now, Luke. Uh, the um what's happened since uh we wrote the book i think is also worth looking at yeah. because i mean the major development which we didn't anticipate and nobody anticipated it anywhere in any teaching context was the move to online teaching and there's nothing very little i'm ashamed to say in the book about specifically about online teaching and so one of the challenges has been uh well I mean, we've all been challenged by the move online because it happened so quickly uh but with dogma approach particularly i've been asked again and again and again well how do you how do you engineer 
these techniques, these activities, etc., in an online context. And what what are your thoughts on that, Luke? Does dogma work online? Yeah, I think it. I think it can do. I think the one challenge is building community. I think um, you know we we'll, we will have experienced this as teachers online, um, in whatever aspect of our work is online, that you lose the kind of constant um, presence of one another and the way that that builds understanding and community um, if we're online and if we are as we are here in different windows. Um, but I think the, the crucial thing when it comes to thinking about dogma in face-to-face -face versus online teaching is that many of the principles apply. Um, what I, I like to offer as a kind of challenge is the question what direction is the content or most of the content or some of the content in the class coming from if all the content in the class is top-down content which is coming from published sources whether it's the course book and associated materials or supplementary materials um, then that has the same effect online as it has face to face is that people aren't being given the space to communicate their own thoughts and feelings and to experience the language as it develops as they try and do that. Um, if content is being created, being co-created by the people in the room or the people in the windows online, um, in the people in the Zoom call or in the virtual classroom, if they're the ones creating some of the content, most of the content, then it's bottom up. And so that's unplugged or that's dogma, whether you're in a physical classroom or in an online space. And I think many of the kind of principles of try and use fewer published materials and more co-created materials apply in both contexts. Try and have more spontaneous interaction mm -hmm. applies whether you're in a face-to-face -face or an online environment. And we should remember, um, finally, Scott, before I put it back to you, that often our time face-to-face -face is very constrained by our use of online technologies anyway. Exactly. And this is, again, something we perhaps we didn't anticipate or I didn't anticipate in 2000 when I wrote that article. And I was saying that we're inundated with materials. I was thinking mainly of print materials then. But of course, now, uh, much further down the line, we're inundated uh, with online materials, digital materials, etc. Now, this can be a good thing. These are they these offer learning affordances. And I think whether you're teaching online or in the in the in the classroom, uh, the affordances, the opportunities that are offered by accessing English outside the classroom are, are fantastic, which almost in a sense to me, uh, it, it further validates dogma because you, you say, okay, there's really fun ways of practicing grammar online. There's lots of apps, there's lots of this, that, and the other, or great ways of learning vocabulary using Quizlet and all that kind of thing, or there's wonderful text with you know subtitles on YouTube, or there's, you know, uh, bloody, what are they called? Um, TED Talks with transcripts. There's hundreds of things that people can be doing, uh, interacting with other English speakers, et cetera. So why not let them do that, encourage them and show them how to do that productively outside the classroom and keep the classroom space for the really valuable stuff, which is the social. You know, clear all that out. And it's a bit like the idea of a flipped classroom. And I think the flipped classroom works really well with dog. When you say, well, okay, um, we're going to be, the topic of, is in the course book is food, so I want you to go away in advance of the lesson and um, brainstorm some food vocabulary and things that you like eating and things maybe you like cooking and we're going to talk about that and they do the work beforehand and they come to the class and they talk about it and they share their recipes and their experiences, etc. That works both in a real class and an online class but keep the you know again the, the operative word here is, is space it's providing that space because the small culture of the classroom is such an important learning culture and the teacher is ideally placed to support that culture but not dominate it yeah? and nor should the materials dominate it or nor should the technology dominate it uh so i mean i think what we're doing now i i I dare, dare I say it, but in a sense is demonstrating the power of an online community because we're talking, <laughs> nobody else is talking, it's just you and me, Luke, at the moment, but um, maybe we should throw it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, 
Yeah, I think so. I was, I was going to ask two things, Scott. One, one is I think we should do some Q&A in a second. And just before then, I wonder, we've both been uh, training um, in, in the years since the book came out. You're currently training on the ITDI course that you mentioned. Um, is, is there anything else in, in the works? What happens next for Dogma and Unplugged, do you think? Ah, well, um, good question. I mean, I, I, I mentioned earlier, and I said I'd talk about this, that, 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 that there does seem to be a kind of revived interest, or maybe it, has, maybe it was the pandemic that suddenly made people think about we need alternatives to just delivering Grammar McNuggets online or lecturing to the students online. There must be another way, and that's there's been a lot of interest in dogma. And also, I think there's another generation's come through since we started to, in 2000. There's a whole new generation of teachers who are hungry for alternatives and are sick. And also, I have to say it, I, dare I say it, that the course books have not moved as fast as pedagogy has moved. Uh, uh, they're still dragging their tails and we're still, nothing really innovative has happened in the 20 years since dogma first emerged. So I think we have every right to, <laughs> to say, listen, give us some space here because we've got something to offer. Um, and hence the interest in the teacher training programs, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. I've been training refugee, teachers of refugees, for example, to teach online using dogma approaches. And that's been a real eye opener, actually. Um, very interesting, frustrating, but really interesting. So, I mean, I suppose, yes, where do we go from here? And I, I don't know, what do you think? Is there room for another a new edition of Teaching Unplugged? Well, <laughs> I think that might be. Um, I'd, I'd like to think so. I mean, I, I've definitely, you know, everything that went into the first book from my side was based on teaching in the classroom. Um, and I think I've learned so much from teacher training over the last 10 years. And as you say, the context has changed in so many ways. I think big data on a broad societal level has changed um, the way that we think about education and language. Uh, it's increased the tendency to itemize language and competence. Um, you know, the global scale of English is one example of that. Um, where where people's uh, you know competence is minutely measured in in ways that um, uh, strike me as not necessarily helpful. So yeah, I'd like I'd like to think there is um, room for uh, a second bite at the cherry. Is that the expression? <laughs> yeah. Let's 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 see if people have some questions. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So using the chat, I think is that okay, Isabella? Have we got permission to? Throw any comments. You have to permission to hack anything to control. I mean, this is we have to give space, right? Absolutely. <laughs> it would be great to hear people. As you well can as crack people. you can crack the, yeah. the 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 Let's discussion. So I guess people can um speak up or write um yeah, their do whatever. So whatever. if you want to speak, uh just do the use the icon, the hands up icon. And if uh, I miss it, uh Isabella, if you notice anybody's hand up, then Paolo. Paolo, Paolo is Paolo. Hi, Scott. Hi, Luke. Hey. Good to talk to you. I, I do have a question uh, because, um, as you know, we, we, we do write uh, course books. And, and the thing is that um, course books, they, they are unfortunately more often than not uh, written, taken into account what the, what the market needs or, or rather what the market think it needs. So how, yeah. how, how do you suppose we could deal with that and, 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 and go a bit more unplugged? Uh, considering the, what the market think it needs. Well, yeah, I mean that you're absolutely right, Paolo. I mean the market dictates, and it's not just the market. I mean, um, especially with younger learners, it's the school system that dictates, it's the parents that dictate, it's the stakeholders that dictate. Yeah. Uh, so I guess you know it's a process of kind of mutual education. I mean, I'm certainly not implying that the that the um, publishers are. Uh, and antagonistic towards uh, innovation, uh, but it's innovation in, very, in baby steps often because of the reasons you just said, because the, the market can only tolerate so much and course books are very expensive to produce and who's going to risk something that's going to flop? Um, I don't know, Luke, do you have any answers to that? What, I mean, I think it's a great question because it brings in the, the broader, um, uh, the broader influences on our work, whether it's from a, a writing or a teaching point of view. Um, and, and I think, I mean, ideally one would seek to 
change the terms of the broader conversation around education. Um, that is clearly not something you can do by changing something in your next lesson. Um, but perhaps by challenging some of the expectations that shape those demands in the market um, and challenging the, the, the kind of one of the core notions, I think, which is that we need to know exactly what's going to happen at every stage of a course. And we need to know exactly what the learning outcomes and these are the things which need to be tested. I think Jane's just put her hand up. Jane. Jane's about to unmute. Okay. Yeah, um, I agree so much with what you say. The broader market needs to be educated. Um, and I've just been doing some research over the last couple of years um, on and off research with somebody who teaches a SELTA course at the University of Central Lancaster at Lancashire. And we had a meeting where we had about 80 trainers and we did a questionnaire about task-based language teaching. And most of them said that they use task-based language teaching in their lessons, not all, but most, and that they really thought it was good because it had gave lots of opportunities for, as, as you were saying, of spontaneous interaction and social interaction amongst the class. Um, however, there's no way that they would train um, that they would seriously train their CELTA trainees to do it because the textbooks um, demanded another approach. So what I think we need to do is, um, well, Luke, you touched on it, and I think you did as well, Scott, is make sure that trainers, make sure that trainers influence the people who, um, who do the testing of CELTA SELSA candidates, um, the exam, maybe, you know, the exams need to be maybe shifted a bit, trained, um, changed a bit so that there's more um, awareness of the value of teaching unplugged. Um, so that trainees come out saying, we want textbooks with this. Mm -hmm. um, because at the moment, they're being trained to cope with books like Headway and, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, yeah. I think only six. There are some teaching unplugged CELTA courses. Somebody in the chat um, asked. Yes, there are some. We interviewed ten people in detail, um, in um, and four or five of them run CELTA courses that are teaching unplugged, and they do all the input sessions at home, just like you were saying. The the, the theory and the input sessions are done at home, and they spend all the time online, um, simply preparing their lessons and working out how to do stuff and talking about teaching and then actually teaching and then coming back and feeding back. So it is happening, but very slowly. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Jane. You, Jane. Any more um, questions, comments? Feel free. I, I, think, I think people are being a, a, a bit shy. Uh, about the, about the whole question thing, but it, it, it was it was quite interesting to 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 see that uh, you both managed. Oh, Clever's got a question. Yes, yeah, that's other. Say Clever's question. Oh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity uh, of being here. Uh, the, the question is about the amount of support needed for one-to-one uh, -one learners in this unplugged teaching way that we can go as. Uh, teachers because I noticed that for some of them they might just freak out when they are having one-to-one -one lessons without uh, support. Uh, 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 my experience tells me that some of them just they do feel that they, they need a, a huge amount of uh, resources so the more we show them the more they feel we are prepared to teach unlike what Dogmi tells us right. So how can we increase face validity of our classes in light of Dogmi? I think that's the question. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think the one-to-one -one context is a really interesting one because it, in some senses you think, well, this would be the one that you would have most freedom because you can you know, design your syllabus according to the learner's needs. Um, but at the same time, as you say, that the learners have very, they're paying a lot more than they would in a, class and they have very strong expectations that the teacher is going to be the professional who has very you know well-planned lessons etc 
I have a story actually somebody told me once where they were in a one-to-one -one class that would encourage the learners to speak initially at the beginning of the lesson, have this chat about, you know, what did you do at the weekend, that kind of thing. Uh, but they would have on the table in front of them a copy of Raymond Murphy's English Grammar and Use. And every time that the conversation started to dry up, the teacher would move towards the grammar book and the student would go, oh no, and also oh, I saw this really great <laughs> So you, you can use the materials. <laughs> As a as a club to bludge in the students. If you stop talking, we're going to do some grammar. <laughs> I think, okay. yeah, I think I think an another. Um, so go on, Scott. I, I've lost it. Go on. No, 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 no. But I don't want to trivialise your question, Claver, because I mean it, it's an important one. I don't think any teacher wants to go into any class looking like they haven't prepared. They're not a professional. Yeah. Yeah, I would say always have backup, Scott. That was what I was going mm. to say. I, mm. You know, I think any. As you said, no teacher would want to go into a classroom in any context, whether it's a group or a one-to-one, -one, without um, some form of plan and without some materials that will be coming to the class, coming to use. Whether that's a coursework mm -hmm. or it's, you know, it might be uh, sort of realia, as we used to call it, for the the one-to-one -one class based on the the needs and interests uh, of that student. So, I think I think it's about seeing how almost seeing how far you can go before you get to the materials and sometimes that will suit the student and sometimes it will suit one-to-one -one learners i'm thinking of maybe um uh, business learners people who, who are learning for to, to help their professional lives and who know most of the technical vocabulary but perhaps need some of the social vocabulary that they need when interacting with uh, with english language speakers from around the world in their work so I, th I think sometimes, and I think the other thing that happens, and this happens, uh, Clever, with one-to-one -one students and with groups, is that if students see us responding to their language um, in real time and giving them attention and supplying uh, some of our expertise, explaining something, giving them a little more language in the area that they're looking for it, then I think they start to, to trust us. I think they can see what's happening. Um, and 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 they, they can see that the if you if you like there's a kind of emergent structure to the classes as well as emergent language as we start to deal with it in ways that they become familiar with. Gabriel has a nice question here in the chat uh, that we quickly address, um, which is that uh, his in his context. Teachers are very skeptical about teaching beginners using task-based learning or dogma, partially because of the belief that L1 should be completely banned, uh, and that also the belief that beginners should use only very controlled language. Yeah, and this is this that this idea of the beginners using only very controlled language goes way back in the mists of time, and it was certainly how I was trained initially. It was only when I closed the classroom door and started experimenting with my beginner students in Egypt, where I first started teaching, that I discovered that. To collectively, they had a lot to say, but they had to do it collectively. So they'd construct texts out of the words they knew, mutually knew. Um, and the L1 question wasn't one I explored because I didn't speak Arabic at the time. Uh, so I couldn't exploit the fact that I could have scaffolded their emerging conversations using. So what are you trying to say? Tell me in Arabic or tell me in Portuguese. What are you trying to say? Uh, and that can cut so many corners and save so much time. Uh, that it just, and it seems to be the, the, the logical way to teach beginners, but not just beginners, and even further up the scale, maybe points where you say, listen, I, I don't get it. What, do, what, do you, what, do you, what are you trying to say? Just tell me quickly in Portuguese, and then we'll go back to English. That seems to be perfectly legitimate. Nobody's yeah. going to die because they spoke Portuguese in the classroom. Well, we, we, we certainly hope not, Scott. Um, I, I, I'd like to, to, to thank you both very much for this uh, fantastic chat. It was, it was really nice to, to follow you both and, and to have Jane's contributions as well. Um, we, we are about to wrap up because we have a second round table just uh, about to, to, to start about the future of language centers in Brazil. It is, it is going to be uh, in Portuguese, but uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, with your Spanish Scott and, and Luke giving, given uh, uh, your knowledge of Portuguese, you're more than uh, welcome to, to, to join us and, and follow thank that. You, <clears throat> so thank, thank you, Paul. So thank you both very much. And uh, I, I hope to see you very soon, yeah?
Yeah. Thank you. Us, us too. Thanks, everyone. For, for Thanks so much, Carla. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Luke. Bye bye. Ciao. <laughs> Time for a drink. That was great, you two. It was really good. Enjoyed it. Oh, thanks, Jane. Appreciate that. It was really nice to see you there. It was lovely to hear lots and lots of interesting things. I'm going to have to change my plenary now a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, because you really inspired me. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Thanks okay. Hope to see you soon. Take care. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.